I promise to tell only the truth, the truth, and only the truth. Hala. And then, Emma, okay, guys, sir. The piano boy sick. Now, why? 22 years in the game on sign that the near boy all day no night that the coach now wash your yeah fly sir then cry now ya or yeah hi sir why did you have was i take your plots i had me abroad but i cut you across now why cry me jina me nice so tripod um who me nine back on so tripod on the family said me me demo so high call tina match white full screen so i come me carry and know what i so try to me rap on that that me turn so i try all rappers here do so so me dear not chop you my traffic not chop security a pack all me float is a king swimming golo my shatter gun i said bandana moko who say lazy and yeah zeal and go to me in your vvip because i'm v8 speed so mellow but you have a the rap doctor rap taking from a piece of you know be my matter featuring kwame eugene i hope you're checking out the album all right, thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right, quickly, tell us about yourself. Who are you? Wow, you don't ask an Ashanti man to tell you about himself. You want me to brag? <laughs> what type of question is this? Okay, so, um, Ochiano Kwame is a 43 year old boy, I'm married to one woman, and with two kids, two children, from the same woman. Um, he's been married for 10 years. Um, he comes from a family of eight. Um, father was an accountant, mom was a teacher, six of us, five boys and a beautiful lady called Amma Kwendu. And almost all the boys in the family are musicians. So senior, brother, senior brothers who play any instrument, write poems, write books or sing. And my younger brothers make up the brothers, uh, Flo Kingstone and Kunta Kinte. So come from a family um, of writers, basically. Uh, my father was also very creative. He wrote six books to put himself through um, education when he was growing up. Um, my, on, my, on my mother's side, so I, I say I'm an Ashanti from the Akan um, family. And my father is an Oyoko. Uh, my mom is an Adriana. And um, my mom comes from Bima in Asante Mampong, around in Suta. So that makes me an Asante person. And I... I love life. I I love myself. I love people. I believe that um, if God um, was to be a human being, he would have been an artist. You know, so I love the arts as well. And I don't know what else to say. So I have a master's degree in marketing strategy. My first degree was in linguistics. I can option. I'm pursuing a PhD right now in um, music marketing still. I run a few businesses, okay communication, I sell hair, but out of all these things, the most important one for me is my role as a dad, you know, so I don't take it lightly at all. I take it, I think I make, I do everything that I do, apart from the developmental work that I do for my country, all the things that I do for profit, I do it because of my family, you know, so usually I'm, the most difficult thing for me right now is to find a balance between making my family get my time and also spend sharing the same time with job that will get me profit i have done nine albums i'm part of a defunct um, hip life duo called achiami i've been a solo artist from 2004 till date and i love myself it's all right <laughs> have you always wanted to be a musician i think so i think so when i was much much younger um you know my father was overly educated. He was one of those people that Nkoma sent to Rome to go and study. So when he came back, he was hoping that all his children would become book long like he was. So even though I exhibited uh, traits of being an artist, my dad didn't quite see it. So he was trying to make me an accountant or trying to be, make, force me to become a lawyer or something like that. But I remember that. I was always interested in poetry, I can poetry especially, you know, so, and every time I would learn an amazing poem, go from house to house to deliver it, the satisfaction that my audience had gave me a sense that I'll be an orator of a kind, I didn't quite know, so 
fast forward into secondary school when rap music had become the gem and everyone was catching the fever. I also caught it right. <laughs> you know, so when Shabarang sneezed in Jamaica, we could feel it in Ghana. And um, I also slowly became a rapper, linking my poetry, the poetry that I had been taught at home and in primary school to rap music. I realized that, oh, rap music is nothing but poetry in motion, you know, so I caught it quite early. And so let me say from, the, from 1991 till date, I realized that, okay, I was going to be a rapper. Okay, do you see yourself being a rapper, a musician forever? Or there's going to be a point where you'll drop a microphone for? Oh, no, no, no. I, you know, one thing that is strange with the artist is that God is also an artist. And he chooses very special people like me to become artists. It's, art is not something that you can decide to become. If you decide to become an artist, you are not a real one. Art will choose you. It's like a... A, a foul, you know, so I don't think that no matter how much money I'm making <clears throat> or how frustrating the music industry is in Ghana or in the world, I don't think I will ever drop the mic. I don't think. Maybe I, would, I might change the art forms from maybe more rap to more singing or more singing to more poetry or more poetry to more novels or something. The art form will change, but slightly but the rudiments of what i'm doing will always be here an orator all right now growing up as a musician or uh, up until this stage can you share with us the greatest challenge that you have greatest challenge hey, so many of them i don't think i can so one of my biggest um my biggest challenges was that in 1999 when i become the most popular young musician in this country um, because my father had died, I went to live in America for three years. In America, I did everything. I washed dishes. My plan was to go to Ohio State University. But I didn't even know that with the type of visa, that with a P3 visa um, or P B1, B2 visa, I couldn't go to the university, you know, so in, in another person's country. And so I went to live there for three years. I did everything, construction, washing dishes, hustling. I did everything. And I came back empty-handed. It's not that coming back, that was a challenge. Two, two things became my challenge. One, the fact that I couldn't do music and be appreciated again within that period. That was very challenging for me. And also the fact that I had to come and start afresh. That was challenging. I remember when I came back, DJ and the Dusty took me to an um, Inkase uh, album launch at the beach. And when I grabbed the mic and I started rapping, nobody knew who I was. And I had already done Masana Bar and Twaswa, so I've done three albums. I was so, um, in quotes, successful for a 22 year old boy. And then when I came back, just three years, everybody had forgotten about who Achami or who Achami Kwame was. That was heart wrenching. And how did I overcome it? By working hard, by paying attention, by being diligent with, with, with my dream, you know. So that's one. The second thing was that I remember before I went to tech. Um, it was like six years after that, before I went to tech, the, the night before, the weekend before school would start for Ochiame Kwame to go back to tech, I had this rickety BMW called the Antichrist. The car had an accident at Circle after I, wa I was going to buy um, Honest Chef for Kunta. He likes Jollof and those things. And so I had an accident. So for one whole or two semesters, I had to join the shuttle. And when we say shuttle, it's not just a, a nice bus, it's a trotro. I had to join the trotro, Chiamme Kwame, to take for one whole semester or two. And I don't like the the idea, so I, I'm trying to delete it from my hard drum, you know. So for one whole semester, I had to go to school working or joining the bus. That was a big challenge. I have yeah. so many challenges, but this one was, was particular, these two. Okay, now your job as a musician is quite an interesting one, but could you tell us what you hate most about the job? The truth is that I hate nothing. In fact, in my house, the word H-A-T-A -A, is forbidden in my house. If you pay attention to my social media, I have never written H-A-T-E before. I don't. When I, since I gained consciousness as a human being, I've realized that you attract what you think about the most. I don't hate anything. Everything that happens to me is an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn. I know, uh, like the way I'm saying it is like philosophical, you know, it's like a girl broke my heart so all of a sudden I'm becoming... <laughs> that, that's not what I mean. But, 
but I don't think that. Hey, I think he is quite aware. I, I think it's a spirit. I think it's a, something that can possess you and break your heart and pour cortisol onto your system until you get depression and you get schizophrenia and you become mad and take off your clothes. Hate is too much. I don't hate anything about the arts. However, I dislike certain things. You know, like the way the industry is ill-structured, the way um, it is so difficult, the way television stations still take money from artists before they play our content, um, the way the media or parts of the media and the, and the creatives are not working together. You know, I don't like um, the way some of the media houses do not pay attention to, to the artists. For example, um, Miss Chocolate or Cocoa Processing will always constantly do a backward integration by realizing that cocoa is their raw material. Therefore, they go back to farmers to empower them because when farmers have right produce, they are going to get the right raw material, you know, so, and since the media has taken a step, you know, ahead in, in the creative arts industry, I would expect the media to go back and do a backward integration and, you know, to do more partnerships with artists, to do more seminars with artists, more workshops with artists, because one cannot exist without the other, you know, so um, that's what it, I, I think, because um, one of the difficult things for an artist in this country is to find someone who is very knowledgeable to work with. So when someone has an MBA in finance or in marketing or in branding, that person is quickly going to find a job to do at Ghana Commercial Bank or MTN, you know, so, or Joy FM or Peace FM, you know, so, and because our industry is so ill-structured, it's difficult to find real professionals to work with. So I would expect that um, like uh, City FM, who is using music as her raw material, will always do a backward integration to making sure musicians get it better so that we can continuously produce the raw material that they use to sell advertisement. You know, so these are some of the things that I do not like about the industry. All right, now let's stay a bit longer on the industry. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate the industry? The music well, I think mean, that's a difficult question. How do I rate it as compared to Hollywood, as compared to Nigeria, as compared to what? How would I rate okay, it? Let me come. Is the industry what you expect it to be? What you expect? No, average? not not at all. Not, I, but it will be difficult for me to rate it. But I'll, if I'm to tell you that this is where I was expecting the industry to 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 be at. But when I, as intelligent as I am, have been a part of it for 22 years, no. I don't think that um, some of us have contributed our quota properly into the industry. Yes, I've contributed into health, I've contributed into development, I've contributed into creating content, into excitement. But the industry in herself, as, as a body, as an institution, or the industry in herself, no, um, I don't think that it is doing as it is doing as well as it should. So the industry needs more government attention. It needs more regulations. The industry needs more legislation. The industry needs more professionals to work. The industry needs more togetherness. The industry needs more writers. The industry needs more people should publish more books on songwriting, on marketing, on branding. People should publish, people should make a conscious effort to bring industry together. You know, because as if you go as one person, you can go faster, but when you go as a group, you go further. You know, so it is important that um, we, we work, but notwithstanding, the industry has done some great things. I remember when I started as an artist, it was almost impossible to see your chamber on an MTN billboard, or to, to see Reggie Rockstone on a Guinness billboard, or to see an artist being signed for 500,000 Ghana cities. You know, these brand associations, it was impossible because people perceived the artist to be a school dropout screaming for a quick buck. But all these things are changing. Now, I remember when I started, before I can get my music to I, I, to get uh, HMV to stock my music in London or in New York, 
I had to send someone to London to go and let them have a review of my album and decide whether it's good enough. Now with one click, one artist can put his music on 250 sales distribution platform from iTunes to Spotify to whichever, 250 at once. And social media is, has also come. Now we have bloggers so that if, as an artist, if you are able to play your game well, you, are, you get some of these bloggers to send your music to people that either to would not listen to you know so the industry is changing it's not at the pace that i wish it would change but it is still changing for the better but we can do way better okay now you've made mention of investors governments you made mention a bit of um, consumers as well but let's look at the market for music in ghana do you think it's encouraging because for other countries let's say nigeria they have a population they have people to listen to them. Do you think the market for Ghanaian music in our country here is encouraging? For the market, let's first look at the size. Yes, I think the market is encouraging. It's just that musicians and producers and distributors and managers and brand people in the industry, we are not working hard, you know. But the market, I mean, how many people are in Jamaica? Three million. Look at what they do with their music. Reggae music is everywhere. It even comes to Ghana and become like the staple music. It becomes the music. We say, I'm a Ghanaian musician. What type of music do you do? Reggae down solace is with such pride. It's because the, the, the reggae music as, as, a, as a, a force is, 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 is strong, you know. So it's not about the size. So for the size there, we don't have any argument. And then let us look at the, let's segment it into groups. So if I segment the music market into groups, I can get maybe the achievers, the kings, the CEOs, the progressives, people like me, 40, married, in middle, you know, um, management. And then we can get the trendies, with the young people, students, young people, you know. So if I segment the market into three, I can confidently tell you that it is the young people who I call trendies, they are the ones that, that follow music. They are the ones who have the time to stay on Twitter and write about, oh, Jeremy, I love your song. And they are the ones that get the opportunity to argue with people. They are the ones that, let's say, YFM or, or Hit FM says, um, oh, it's a Jeremy's birthday. Um, which of his songs would you like to listen to? It's, I think it um, ranges from between 13 to like 20 something. That, that would be like 60% of the people who contribute to these tweets. And so if you're an artist and you are my age and you, you, are, you turn 43, it is almost, it is difficult for you to be in constant touch with all this unless you behave like a child, you know, so or unless you behave like one of them. And it is unrealistic for a progressive to behave like a trendy, you know, so when it happens like that, you might lose a big chunk of the young you know of the young segregation however you still have the progressives even though they might not be as many as the young people because i think the the percentage share for youth in ghana is like 50 something percent you know so even though they might not be as as many as the the, the but it's still people with disposable income it's, it's still people that can say, ah, I like what Chami, let's put him on the billboard. I like what Chami, let's give him $100,000. Those are the, that is the, 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 that is the, the age group of people that you have. You know, so if you an artist and you behave in a certain way that these people find you exciting, you are supposed to do business, even though you don't have the masses, you know, hailing you and tweeting about you. And then we'll talk about the achievers, which is the chiefs, the kings, the CEOs at that time were turning 50. They still would like to have fun one day at the party, dance to one corner, but they still want their machi dede. You know, they still want their kodwenpi, they still want their daddy loom, but they want to still listen to their ohneba kisi. You know, so I think there's a market for everyone. However, what we have failed to do with this market, that one I'll put the I'll put it at the doorstep of event organizers, is to create events that seeks to cater to all these three categories so almost all the events that we have in this country almost all not all are targeting the trendies and when it happens like that it creates a very big vacuum between the progressives and the achievers you know and the trend because people my age do not get to go out unless they really 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 are young at heart 
you know they want i want to sit down and watch samini sing beautiful songs with a live band and serenade me and so i can buy some drinks and go home happy you know i am not very interested in loud banging performances or when most people my age think like that you know so when the type of uh, music uh, the type of music events that event organizers do is constantly for the trendies it creates a certain euphoria that that the market is not good but the market is amazing it's segmented beautifully it is left for musicians and their managers and um, event organizers to take advantage of all these segmentations all right now let's come back to you your brand name how do you do I remember that in 1991, I was called Whiskey. Yes, I was called Whiskey, um, and I, I, I remember that we used to be in a group. Where I, I used to rap or chime Kofi would write the raps, and I would go and sing it. You know, so at Queen uh, Kumase, at uh, Golden Tulip, and um, at the Shimai Gardens Children's Park, we used to rap. And so when we, when I gained consciousness. We realized that, okay we have to find a name that is that is good enough for the market so i will ocham kofi's slave name is dan daniel you know so it used to be whiskey and then we do wisdom okay and so it used to be waste done but in 96 when we found a producer we we sort of realized that it will not work because people who were listening to rap music at that time were very skeptical because everywhere we take our demo the people will say, ah, can't you make music like that Dumba or Machidede? This raga raga there. So we realized that, okay, the music, people do not find the music interesting. They think it's too much talking, you know, and it's too fast. It's too fast for the type of people that were buying music at that time. So can we put a nomenclature on the product so that they will find it interesting? So we took Achiame, which meant um, the linguist, the plural, and Achiame is singular so i became ochiame kwame and ochiame kofi and together we were ochiame you know so we had to go to a place where people respected and which was the palace the court and around that time we're not the only ones thinking like that you got nanano we had koti we had adeshie we had this everybody took a name from the court because that was a place of respect and authority you know so that is what gave birth to the name ochiame so let's yeah, what's your relationship with Ochami Kofi now? Oh, Ochami uh, Kofi. And this is the part where he, he has zoomed in. I met him four days ago. Ochami <laughs> <laughs> Kofi, my, my um, relationship is amazing. We have an amazing, amazing relationship. Um, you know, Kofi and I have been gone beyond friends. We are brothers, you know. So, and even my personal assistant that got me to come here is Ochami Kofi's relative. You know, so if you look at his face properly, you will see. So Chem Kofi and I, we are family. Our relationship is awesome, awesome. We have an amazing. About a week ago, we were chatting on his Instagram page. One of the pictures, somebody came to write. When can we get a song from both of you? When can we get an album? I said for an album, you are pushing it. Let's just make it a single. You know, so um, we are amazing. I just spoke to him about three days ago. If you go on my page, you see that on my birthday, I share. A birthday with one of his daughters so my birthday when you go on there you see that i posted the daughter it's all love now some time ago you received backlash for involving the kids in music what, what can you say to that why the decision oh. in the first place and what's your reaction to well like, i don't know I, I strongly know that my father wrote books i remember when i was six he had already started teaching me what a metaphor is what a simile is he had already started teaching me how to write and if you pay attention to both Kunta and uh, Stone, you realize that they are also prolific writers. It's because it didn't happen by chance. It's because someone made a conscious effort to teach us how to write, you know, so, and I know how to do a lot of things, but I know how to write. I know how to be an artist a lot. That's how I'm able to sustain a 22 year old career and still be fresh. You know, so what else do I leave my children? I can't leave them gold, leave them a mansion, leave them a car, all those things, you can lose them. What I have is know how to manage a personality brand. And that's what I'm teaching my children. So 
I'm giving my children what I know and, and sometimes I just ask if I were to be a doctor and I took my children to the consulting room and they, I gave them um, a stethoscope and a thermometer and when you come, my daughter will come and check you say, ah, oh, what a responsible doctor. But because I'm an artist, people perceive that I've already started teaching these children how to smoke weed or they are, they are drinking tramor or something. People it's just disrespect for the art. How can you, how can someone get a backlash for doing the right thing? It's okay, I'm making my children popular. Yes, I'm making my children popular because I am popular. That's what I know how to do. So when my daughter turns 18 and she de decides to go to the law school and she has 18 million people on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and she says, Daddy, I'm a private person, then she turns it off. But if she decides to be a carpenter, if she decides to be creative and she would need a constituency of people online to sell these things to, then I've given her 18 million followers or 18 million subscri subscribers on YouTube. That's the legacy I want to live with my children. Now, people say celebrities' marriages really do not last, but there are someone who has proven this assertion to be wrong. You made mention earlier that you've been married for about a decade now. Could you tell us what the secret is to? Because I want to say you have, you have you've had one of the most um, uh, in, um, inspiring marriages because I've watched videos, I've seen clips. But what has been the secret? The secret is simple. Whenever my wife does something bad, I don't take it too hard. You know, the secret is simple. In the evenings, when I'm tired, I go home and I want her to hold me and she gives me a horse kick. I don't come and complain on social media. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is really simple. It's just about forgiveness, like on the real. It's about forgiveness because we are human beings. I, I, I'm the most difficult person to, to be with because I'm set up in my ways. I live in my head. You know, so if you are able to marry me for 10 years and being with me for 15 years, then it means you really, really, truly love me because I'm difficult. I want my things like how I want my things. You know, so um, it's just I think that I do so many bad things. My wife forgives me. She does bad things. I forgive her. And another thing that has worked for both of us is that we decided, we spoke about the type of relationship that we wanted to have the number of children we want to have, the way we want to treat each other, who is going to be the boss. When I met my wife, um, she was getting a master's degree and I just completed SS, you know, and I had not continued. So I remember that. No, no, university. SS, yes. <laughs> I was just about, in fact, I went to school because I didn't want to marry a short Ashanti lawyer who would take off my tongue and write a number on it for another man, you know, so I had to up my day, you know, so. That's why I went to school, I didn't do it for, for much. So we sat down and then we spoke about exactly what type of relationship we are going to have when we are in public. What can you tell me? What amount, what level of my ego can you bruise? Where are the places you can go? What can't you? We spoke about all these things, the number of children we want to have, where we want to live, what your favorite colors. We spoke about a lot of things, you know, so and we decided that we are going to go by it until we find out that these things are a cake and it's no more relevant to our relationship. And so for the first, say, seven years, we live by these rules. One of these rules will be that no matter how angry you are, you cannot hang up a phone on me. I also can never hang up. When you go to a place and your phone is dying, you need to send a test or make a phone call. That my phone is dying, but you can find me at point X. So you can call me on this person's number. No matter what you are doing, if I call you, must always speak and say that I'm doing this, I'll call you back. You know, so these are some of the some of the little things that create trouble. You cannot put a passcode or a password on your phone unless I know it. You know, so we 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 spoke about all these things, and then we are both very committed people. Now, the second thing that worked is that we brought two children onto the earth, you know, and now our relationship became less about both of us, it became more about these children. So, where they go to school, school fees, insurance, assurance, property, legacy, all those things came, yeah, then we became even more focused and we realized that the closer we are together as a unit, the better it is for these children to have bal balanced parenting. 
you know so we there are times that we are both really angry at each other in the car with the children and we swallow it and smile because the children are in the car you know things like that so the children become more important and another thing is that we do our business together if we break up right now we we'll know how to share the property you know so I won't break up and I don't want to have it with that girl. She's a witch. Don't go and blog that my wife is a witch. We have blogged it already. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we'll talk about the African protection project. Yes. Now, tell us, how is an ordinary day like for you? Like today. So, I woke up today, I dropped my children at school. No, I went to the gym and then I dropped my children at school. And then I went to have two meetings and then. Um, I'm coming to drop. I came to pick them, pick my wife, to pick the children. So I will and drop them. I'll go back to town to go to the studio until like 12. Then I'll come back and sleep. That's an ordinary day for me. On Sundays, if I don't have a show, I don't go anywhere. Even if an angel comes to stand at American House and calls me for $1 million, I won't come. I'll tell them to rather bring it because those are the times that I get to spend a full day with the children and find out how a school, do homework, project work, and try to get inside their heads like my father lives in my head. Now, I know you're working on the African Connection Project. Yes. Is there anything you want us to know about it? Made in Ghana African Connection. African Connection. Af African, African. African. Okay, so, so we started <coughs> working on African Connection Project about four years ago when I was AU ambassador. I was the AU champion for my Africa, my voice. So we're doing um, the vo my, my voice album. I featured so many top African artists from Dudu Manenga, so many top African artists. But I realized that charity begins at home, pardon the cliche. So if I'm going to do this big project in Africa and it was difficult for me to find resources, why don't I rather do one at home and get the learnings so that when I move my concept out into the world or in, onto the continent, I'm more prepared, a bit more prepared to deal with the the problems that i'm about to face so excuse me so we decide after recording almost all the songs we decided not to release it and record the made in ghana album first and release it after which once we get the learnings we will do a made in africa album so that's that's that is that is where the um, african project is at right now do you think somebody who is very, very concerned about the government of Ghana? Yes. Do you have political ambitions? Not yet. I, I do. I think everybody, everybody is a politician. We are all political animals. I do not know if my conscience will allow me to bribe a delegate to vote me as an MP. Then I come back to say bribery and corruption is wrong. Let's develop this nation without it. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. But if there's a way for me to contribute to Ghana without necessarily bribing someone to vote for me, I would love it. So I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. All right, now, yes. we have some questions from some of our um, followers. Somebody is asking, do you ever want to feature Shatawale? Obvious, of course. Of course, I would love to do a song with Shatawale. I think we, Shata and I have spoken about it many, 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 many times. We even um, spoke about the idea for the song, um, only that right now we are both working on different projects. You know, we are working on different projects. In fact, um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I'll do a song with Shata very soon. All right, someone is asking if pink is your favorite color. Pink, no, 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 no. My favorite color, my favorite color is, uh, is white. White is my freak. But today, this one was chosen by my wife. She said that if I wore pink pink today, maybe I might get some meat in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about the Ghana Music Awards. Yes. Being made um, and it has second, a second second national language. language. So what, what do you make of it? What do you make of politicians, their policies? Is it good for us? Is the system hard for you? Well, I, I think I think that in everything, the whole world hangs in a balance. I mean, think about it. God created himself. And then he created Satan, who is an opposite of himself. 
you know, so that we can find a balance. Everything, electricity comes in positive and negative. So the question, answer your question, what do I make of it? There are positive politicians and negative politicians. There are positive politicians who make negative decisions. There are negative politicians who make positive decisions. You know, so for, for politicians, I don't quite, um, I don't quite judge them. I, I think that it is really brave to decide to become a politician. Because once you become a politician, everybody jabs you. Everybody jabs you. Get a small boy like me who has never, you know, tasted or walked in the corridors of power jab me on Twitter for free, you know. So I think it's really brave. What they do is really amazing. I just think that they will pay a little more attention to arts and culture. Yes, that's that's what I think. And to also answer your question on the on the French as national language, I still stand by. I still think that French, Mandarin, um, English, all those languages are amazing languages for transaction and interaction at a global level. But everybody must get their L1. I find some, there's something fundamentally wrong with one nation using another nation's language as their national language. So, to the Akan person, his L1 should be Akan. To the Ga person, his L1 should be Ga. To the Ever, the, his L1 should be Ever. So the national languages must be national language because no matter how popular pizza is, it will never become a Ghanaian dish. You know, so no matter how popular French is, it shouldn't become a national language. However, we should call French, English, Spanish, and all those languages international language, which we can even actually persuade or force children to learn at school or persuade adults to learn. But we shouldn't call it our national. That was where my problem is. I didn't say that we shouldn't learn French. I spent extra amount of money and time to wait for my children after they are done from their first school to go to French school. I, I sit in the car for one and a half hours to wait for them after the children are tired. I know the importance of French, but my problem is with calling it our national language. It is another person's suit can never become a national Ghanaian attack. It should always be Kente. However, if that is our corporate attack, we should look at, oh, this is, whenever we want to look international, we wear a suit. You know, whenever we want to reach international audience, we speak English. But it should not become our national language. That's what, what I was saying. Are you okay with the <laughs> How dare me? How, what do I know? How can I? How can, <laughs> what do I know? I don't know much. I don't know anything about politics. But I think Nane Kufuadu has done um, amazingly well with, uh, with the school, with the, with the free SHS project. I think that it is really courageous because I know that it is very difficult. I mean, delivering it is very difficult, but he is delivering it. And that is the mark of a great leader because his whole concept about it, this is difficult, but we are going to do it. I have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of respect for him for that thing that he has done. If we don't stop it, I believe that in the next 30, 20 years, this nation will become amazing. So for that, yes, I also like the fact that he's made, um, he turned the, the regions into 16 because um, some of these regions are very big and it is not. Even the, the national resources share, the central hospital is in Sunyane and Kachim and Brekum. All these people do not have, but you know, once, you know, so once he has demarcated it, they are going to get their also central hospitals, they are going to get their courts, they are going to get their police stations. I, I, I also... I also like that. But I also think that Nana should pay a little more attention to art and culture. So with that policy, do you think you're winning 2020? Oh, I'm not. I, I can't answer that. If I answer this question, I'm playing God. I don't know what will happen tomorrow at all. All right. Let's go on. <laughs> yes. First of all, what's your decision to make? To win the made in Ghana. I, I love Ghana. Ghana has given me so much. <laughs> so much i think in, in the next one month i'll have one million followers on instagram i mean it's so pampering it's so people have been popular for 22 years whenever i walk through i drive through town people scream out me we love you come and take a picture with us it's all because of ghana so i get all this through ghana what do i give ghana back fortunately I've been able to be blessed with great education, great parenting. I've had a great career. 
So I think that at this point in my career, it is imperative that I redirect all my energies into creating a much better space for where I work, live, and survive, you know, and that is Ghana. So I, I decided to record an album to bring attention to the 10 regions, the little details of things that we take for granted, the food, the way we greet, the way we slap our fingers and snap, you know, the way we are loud, the way we, the way we work. You know, I, so I decided to do an album that will bring the sights and the smiles of the Ghanaian people, you know, bring it together, capture it on a record and put it out there for posterity, especially for children, Ghanaian children growing up in England, France, and Germany and Japan to be able to see music videos, visuals, that will make them proud that they come from a great heritage. And also for people here to understand that it is a blessing to be Ghanaian. And I actually started paying attention to Ghana when I returned from, from New York after three years. And I saw that, I saw Ghana from a totally different perspective. I saw a paradise. I saw sunshine, I saw virtuous women, I saw virtuous people, I saw private business, I saw markets, I saw opportunity to grow. I felt like a human being when I came back here, you know. So, and I'm trying to, as an artist, I'm trying to recapture that vibe on a record and, and send it to people. Maybe some people are feeling even more to re remind them that, hey, we come from a great place. Or if you are not feeling, you are feeling Yankee Yankee, you know that, Charlie, no, 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 this is the, Ghana is the ish, you know, so when you wear something and even it doesn't have African print in it, it should be made by a Ghanaian, you know, so, so there are three levels to a Made in Ghana album, there's the arts and culture, there's trade and also there's nationalism, so this first year, we are doing arts and culture with pieces of trade, next year, God willing, we'll do more trade bazaars and festivals and both in Ghana and in Europe. And then in the final year of Made in Ghana, we'll do nationalism. So I do a Made in Ghana album that speaks to the politics. So I'll answer some of your questions on that record. And it's not just a music, uh, it's not just a, a songs, 10 songs that we are doing. We also have a TV program coming up on Joy Prime called The Sights and Smiles of Ghana that we capture. We've gone around the whole nation to capture festivals, to capture the people. You see, it's beautiful. And then, also, we, we are going to put this television, it's a 25 minutes documentary per week for one whole year. We are going to also put it on YouTube for Ghanaians going outside to see our festivals, to see our rich cultures and our heritage sites and our food, you know. So, I, and at this moment, I just love Ghana. Alright, is there any other projects you are working on? Working on, yes. So, you know, for the past 10 years, I have been working on hepatitis and um, I've been working on hepatitis and my idea is after another 10 years of working on it, I should re reduce the prevalence rate from 15% to 7%. You know, so we're working with the Ghana Health Services, we're working with other um, stakeholders or other partners to make sure we shift it down. So on the 28th of every July, we do a free hepatitis B screening and vaccination for 1,000 people. So this year, it's happening. Now, I've not, we've not chosen the place yet uh, because of Made in Ghana's campaign is holding my neck, you know, so we choose a place and we'll let you know, maybe by June, we'll let you know where we are going, the train's going up. But apart from that, I'm also um, working with the World Bank and Solidaridad as a climate change ambassador. And we've been visiting 52 communities in Brown Half and Western, um, Western region, farming communities to go and talk to farmers about climate smart practices. That's one of the most exciting things that I've done in my 40 year you know, career. I really, really have fun doing that because because that is like scratching the people where it's itching the most, you know. So that's, we've done that. And also we are working with UNICEF. We are working with UNICEF on assisting young parents to understand that it's all right to be yourself around your children and no matter how much you love money you should love your children too because you brought them into the world. We, we are doing so many projects we are doing so many projects all right before you have the final words your family and listeners and viewers what do you have to tell upcoming artists young upcoming artists who are looking up to you I want to tell young upcoming artists to go and buy the Made in Ghana album. 
So when 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 you get the I'll I'll, I'll I'll speak to him. When you get the Made in Ghana album, when you open it, it comes with it comes with a CD. So this is the front, the superhero. You you learn more about this from next month. The superhero is in the front, and then and then this is his back. And the album has about 14 songs, 10 of them taken from each region. And so it's beautiful. And almost all the songs are recorded live. You get a chocolate. And if you do not want to buy it like this, and you are young and trendy, you can go to Aftown Music to go and download it. And very soon it will be on 250 platforms across the world. So this is the Made in Ghana package. Now to up and coming artists. When you meet an artist like, say, Amachi Didi or Rex Uma or Kodwenji or, or an R. Kelly, do not ask them to put money in your project. Ask them to share experiences they've had over the years because most artists are not record labels. However, they have experiences that if you hold a five-minute conversation with somebody like Rex Uma, he can change your career, he can change the direction, he can bring things into such perspective that you will be able to take the mantle and run yourself. So do not ask for a fish. Ask to be taught how to farm or how to fish, you know, so please. At that time that people come to write on my page on Facebook that oh, Chami, you have not helped any artist. I say, I cannot come to your house and hold your hands and take you to the studio. But you can visit my blog on Ghana web. Read about all the things that I write about how to survive as an indie artist, how to do this, how to do that. Or you can listen to my interviews. Or you can DM me on, on Instagram or Twitter and ask me questions about, about the industry that I probably know that you don't know. You know, so do not wait for someone to come and hold your hand to take you into the studio. Now the world is small. Another thing that I will teach you is that, that I can tell you, I think you might know this already. When Nipsey Hussle died, the whole world went to his funeral. Even some of us in Ghana, we cried on social media for him. Was it because he made amazing music? Or because he made amazing music and he did work in the communities? If you are finding it difficult to break through as an artist, solve a problem in your community, pick a broom, Sweep, sweep your community. If you sweep for three months, I tell you, Yen Ghana will bring a camera to come and shoot that 21-year-old boy who wants to claim Ghana. Or that 21-year or 23-year-old boy who wants going from school to school to teach people about fiscal policy, to teach people what they know. Or that 21-year-old girl who is a rapper but also is interested in planting trees. So do not restrict your career to scoring hits. Immediately you stop scoring hits, your career will fade away. Become more, more interesting than someone that people just think of when they want to be excited. You know, so take development into your own hands. Do not go like you want to be a rapper, so you are rapping and tweeting for 22 years. That's not how it's done. Find a way into the room by hook or crook. Thank you.